All right, everybody, thank you again for uh, helping support these daily spaces efforts. As I like to always say at the start, I try to run these more like a crowdsourced podcast, different than some of the other formats that you see here on Twitter. This will be available on all your favorite podcast platforms on the Lead Lag Live banner, Spotify, Apple, and on YouTube as well. With all that said, my name is Michael Gayad, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the hour is Pedro Domingos, who's got a uh, really interesting field of study we're going to be talking about here when it comes to AI. Pedro, for those who are not familiar with your background, introduce yourself. Who are you? How did you get interested and involved in artificial intelligence, and what are you doing now? Sure. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Washington in Seattle. I am an AI researcher. In particular, I focus on machine learning. I've been working on it for 20 years. I was doing it before it was cool, as they say. I've worked in most areas and done a lot of different things. I've also written, I'm probably best known as the um, author of The Master Algorithm, uh, which is a popular science style introduction to machine learning for a broad audience. Okay, let, let's start with the basics. First of all, let's define what machine learning is. It's always been my impression that it's just a, a fancier way of saying regression analysis. But talk <laughs> through sort of defining what machine learning is. Well, maybe the best way to start is with what AI is. So AI is trying to get computers to do the things that normally takes a human to do, things like, for example, solving problems and planning and reasoning and vision and language and learning. So learning, machine learning, is getting computers to learn, you know, in the same way that humans do, like, for example, children do or someone on a new job does or even all the kind of subconscious learning that we do. Machine learning is the attempt to automate that. And it does, you know, use things like regression and statistical techniques. But some people say, oh, machine learning is just glorified statistics, which I think is what you're alluding to. But that's a little bit like saying that architecture is just glorified brick laying. We certainly use bricks in our buildings, but there's a lot more to building those buildings than the bricks. Okay, now you use the word reasoning, which I think is interesting because anything that's machine learning presumably is primarily quantitatively driven, right? How does reasoning factor into into artificial intelligence algorithms which are coded based on data? No, actually, machine learning may or may not be quantitatively oriented. So again, one of the main things that I talk about in the book is the different paradigms of machine learning and the people associated with them. I call them the five tribes of machine learning. And these days, of course, deep learning or connectionism is the most famous one. And another one is statistical learning. But there's also symbolic learning, which is very much based on symbolic reasoning, as the name implies. So in AI, in symbolic AI, symbolic AI is, and for many decades, it was the dominant paradigm. Symbolic AI is built around the idea of symbolic reasoning, which is essentially deduction. How do you automate, how do you automate deduction, reaching conclusions from premises? And machine learning in the symbolic uh, style can be seen as the inverse of that in the sense of what you're doing is automating induction. So deduction goes from, you know, general rules to specific conclusions like Socrates is human, all humans are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. Machine learning is the opposite. It's saying, if Socrates is human, what else do I need to know to conclude that he's mortal? Oh, I need to know that humans are mortal, and now I've just induced another rule, and now I can add it to my knowledge base, and then I can reason by chaining between rules and so forth. So this is what uh, symbolic machine learning is like and where reasoning comes in. More generally, however, in AI, we call reasoning or inference almost anything that we do. It can be quantitative inference. We, we think of vision and perception, and, and so do psychologists, by the way, as, as a type of inference. So it's, you know, the distinction is more like if, if what you're doing with a computer is a task for which there is a well-understood, efficient, a priori set of steps, then it's programming, you write a program, it's ordinary software. If it's something that has to be figured out on the fly by by way of search, then it's AI. And in particular, if it's acquiring new knowledge, discovering a model of the world and so on, then it's machine learning. But presumably in that reasoning, there's still a quantitative aspect of probabilities, right? The likelihood of the reasoning playing out over multiple role of the die. I mean, I have to assume even Tesla's AI is still ultimately spitting out some kind of probability of a crash or of something happening based on the inputs around it. I guess the question becomes, can we rely on on machine learning to really get us to 
the aspect of judgment, because even though probabilities might be high of something happening, you may not want it to actually be the action that's taken. Well, you might be surprised, but strictly speaking, machine learning need not include probabilities or any numbers. In fact, for example, one of the most widely used types of machine learning, maybe even the most, counter to what most people think, is decision trees. And the basic decision tree just makes a, a yes-no prediction or says, you know, what class, you know, like give this person credit or do not give them credit. Now, you can always attach probabilities or some kind of numbers, and usually you do. And you can also use probability to analyze the performance of the system, which, you know, again, an accuracy of, of a machine learning system is just a probability. So at that level, yes, probabilities are always involved. Now you ask the question, how can you know that you trust machine learning? That is a very, well, let me first give you the short answer. The short answer is you don't. But a more complicated answer is that there's a vast number of ways in which you can do that, and some of them can be extremely complex. One of the key aspects of a machine learning system is precisely how much you can trust it and how. But it's not just a matter of the numbers, the probabilities that it puts out, although that can be certainly part of it. It's, for example, a question which is very salient these days because deep networks are very opaque of, can you understand the reasoning process by which I arrived at a conclusion, right? If I say that this person has a lung cancer, why, right? Tell me why you're saying that or, or I won't believe you. Now, we make a lot of efforts to make machine learning models reliable and trustworthy. I mean, people in some areas don't because maybe it's not that important in those areas. You know, it's only in the bulk that you care about what happens. And, or, or maybe just because they have bigger priorities. The thing to realize is that there is often, and we see this play out daily, there is often a trade-off between how powerful the machine learning is and how reliable. And, you know, this maybe is not hard to understand by analogy with a human, right? You can have someone who's very reliable, but then they're also kind of very boring and not very creative. Or you can have someone who takes these leaps of induction and maybe arrives at brilliant conclusions that you hadn't thought of, but then every now and then they also fall flat. And really that is unavoidable and machine learning is prone to that just as humans are. Maybe more because it has less background knowledge, but that's something else we can talk about. Yeah, and the trust is actually an interesting discussion point, I think. I mean, you can get to trust if you open source, but open sourcing an algorithm doesn't necessarily open source the data that the algorithm's making conclusions off of. And then the other part of this is I have to assume that when it comes to the development of uh, AI and advancement, there's probably only a few select players that are large enough with the resources and the spend to really make it a, a bigger thing than it currently is. What's the current state of sort of the, the concentration of developers and number of companies that are involved in AI? Well, the good news is AI is actually less concentrated than, than you might think from the media. Certainly, companies like Google and the other tech giants are the powerhouses. They will usually have the most advanced algorithms, at least for the things that they care about. But this is a power law with a very long tail. So, you know, there's a lot of machine learning in a lot of different industries. It depends on several things. One is how much difference it can make there. Another one is like how much are they able to afford the cost of developed machine learning. And of course, tech broadly construed, hits both sides of there being a lot of benefit and there being money to pay for it. But machine learning has been penetrating in various industries since at least the 90s. And also in terms of research, right, if you just read the, the, you know, the, the media, you think it all comes out of, I don't know, DeepMind and OpenAI and a few others. But if you actually count the number of papers in top conferences and so on, most of them still come out of academia. And also there's so, it's such a broad front that no single company or single you know, group of companies, of half a dozen companies, let's say, can possibly ever hope to dominate, which is good news, both for us as, as consumers and, and you know, for you if you want to do a startup. No matter how much money Google and you know, Meta and whatever threat machine learning, there will always be opportunities for a bunch of other things. There'll be surprises like, you know, like the Googles and the Metas and whatnot and the Amazons will be surprised by stuff even in their wheelhouse, but done by, you know, who, who knows who where. Part of, obviously, the push for AI from a corporate perspective is efficiency and trying to get higher profit margin, right? I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the sort of popular narrative that we're going to be entering a stage where machines take over labor, right? Because I know that's out there, obviously, quite a bit. And we can argue from here till tomorrow about what that means for unemployment rates and 
the inability of humans to keep up with exponential uh, learning from a machine learning perspective. But lay, lay out a future for us. I, I mean, are we are we going to be having a, a, a juncture where pretty much everything is is just run by code and everybody can just sit fat and happy watching TV? <laughs> Natural question. Now, I think it's very important to distinguish between two things. The hypothetical very long term which is, we, we should certainly consider it because it is possible, maybe even probable, which is what you're kind of suggesting, which is that at some point, machines can just do everything better than us, and we can ask ourselves, what will society and the economy look like then? Very interesting question. It might be different from what you know your typical sci-fi movie envisages, but I think, and, and we can get to that, but more importantly, it's what's going to happen in the foreseeable future, meaning now, the next year, the next 10 year. 10 years, maybe even the next 100 years. And what's going to happen there is that this fear that machine learning and AI will lead to the jobs apocalypse is, is in my view, and in the view of many, if not most experts, unfounded. And it's important to understand both why it's unfounded and why people tend to worry about it so much. First of all, if you look at it historically, people have always been afraid decade by decade that automation would lead to a jobs apocalypse. There's newspaper headlines going back to the 1800s about this. And, and AI is just the next level of automation. And if you think about Right, you're referring it, to like the Luddites and all that, right? It's not, I mean, I, to be fair, it's not just Luddites, right? It's, there's an economic argument as to why this might happen, which even a lot of economists worry about, you know, up to Nobel laureates. But there's also some, disappointingly, honestly, but they do. So it's, it's something that definitely needs to be taken seriously. And, you know, and the prospect of losing my job definitely deserves some worrying about, which is Part of what feeds this. But just to give you one example, 200 years ago, 98% of people were farmers. And then the McCormick Reaper and other things came along and farming was automated and now it's 2%. Now the other 96% of us are not unemployed now at all. What we're doing is tens of thousands of occupations that didn't even exist then. And this is what happens with every new wave of automation is that whole new classes of jobs are created. And we've seen that with computers, we've seen that with the web, like web designer, web programmer, that didn't even exist 50 years ago, let, let alone 100, right? So and a lot of new jobs are created. And then the next thing that people say, they say several things. One is that, well, this time will be different because now we're automating intelligence. And, and once we've automated intelligence, there is nothing left for humans to do. This is very naive because intelligence is a million different things, and we are going to automate them much sooner than others because they're easier, right? So at any given point in time, and the foreseeable future will be no exception, there will always be some things that machines can do better and some things that humans can do better. And that frontier, of course, is continuously moving in one direction. But we're very far from the point where machines can do everything better than humans. The other aspect of this is that as things get automated, not only do jobs get created in new categories, right? so there's also the objection like, oh, but I can't teach truck drivers to be programmers. Well, I wouldn't be so condescending. <laughs> Some truck drivers can become programmers. Or, for example, factory workers can learn to operate machines that have more software that automate a lot of their work, but that, for example, also cause 50 workers, what used to run, what used to take 50,000 workers to run. And as a result, for example, a lot of manufacturing is coming back to America. So, surprisingly, you, can, you know, that it's not this black and white thing. You're either a programmer, you're a manual worker. And by the way, Blue-collar work is a lot harder to automate than white-collar work for reasons that we can explore. But we've discovered that, you know, with some surprise. But that's another thing that, that we often get wrong. And so not only can a lot of people re be retrained to do a lot of things, and of course that is important to have that continuing education element, but most importantly, in the net, automation creates more jobs than it destroys for various reasons, one of which is Let's say I automate truck driving, right? Which, by the way, we sorely need because we're running out of truck drivers. They're retiring. It's not a great job. But if goods become cheaper, then people just use their money for other things. So now more people can be construction workers because people buy bigger, better houses. Or they can be waiters because we now eat out more. Or like the, this is well known in economics. When the price of something goes down, the demand for the complements goes up. So when the price of, you know, like the best way to think of AI is, it's something that is going to massively and is massively decreasing the cost of intelligence, or to be more precise, of certain types of intelligence, which greatly increases demand for its complements, and then people can provide the complements, 
right? So there are all of these ways in which AI creates more jobs than it destroys. The problem is that people always see the ones that are going to be destroyed rather than the ones that are going to be created. But this is an optical illusion that we need to get over. The problem that I that I always go to is the more that there's automation and the easier it is to get to a conclusion, the less likely people are to actually think about if the conclusion is right, right? So I'll relate this to the chat GPT, right? Well, GPT, which is getting all this attention and craze. I've never used it. Several people sent me DMs about it the last few days, just oddly enough, all at once uncorrelated. But I keep using this line, uh, Pedro, that amateurs look to the right of the equal sign, pros look to the left. <laughs> and, and, incre- and, and really what I'm referring to there is process and inputs versus the output, right? You don't know if the output's real unless you know the inputs are, are valid and, and factor in errors in that equation. The concern that I have with the sort of trend towards AI and the ease with which things end up being done and found is that you almost have a certain degree of lack of intellectual intensity by those looking for the answers, right? Because you can't really have people learning to think if they're so used to always getting the answer at their fingertips. Well, I would go even further and say that the problem with AI is that it's very easy to misinterpret in a number of ways, which again, we learned in the field in the early days, even the pioneers made a lot of these mistakes. But these days we see people from the media to CEOs to just ordinary people making that mistake all the time, or those mistakes, I should say. And, you know, things like ChatGPT or the famous Lambda that was sentient, according to this Google engineer, are very good examples. And part of the problem is that AI is a black box to most people. And they don't understand what is going on inside. And they see stuff coming out that looks like intelligent behavior. And indeed, machine learning is insidiously good at faking intelligence behavior, i.e. giving you things that correlate with intelligent behavior. And then you assume that the whole range of human intelligence, free will, consciousness, will to power, emotions, blah, 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 are there. And they're not. Right. So in fact... One of my biggest goals in writing the master algorithm was that like everybody needs to have at least a basic conceptual model of what an AI is doing. And then it's not such, uh, you know, it needs to be demystified. There are certain types of computations going on. Their goal is to produce intelligence, but they're very different from what humans do. So, for example, the notion that Lambda or ChatGPT are conscious is ludicrous I understand why it doesn't seem ludicrous to someone just who's just looking at the black box from the outside, and you ask it, are you conscious? And it says, yes, I'm conscious. But, you know, there was a black box in the 60s called Eliza that already did that and fooled people who spoke with it for maybe not more than 10 minutes, and now it can last for longer. But it's very important to, for people to understand that what's going on, you should, one way to look at this is don't believe an AI demo. <laughs> it maybe is a good way to look at it. An AI demo is probably something that was cherry-picked to look as impressive and intelligent as possible. You shouldn't believe or you shouldn't decide how intelligent something is until not only you've had a casual chat with it, but you've asked it very probing questions. And when you ask those probing questions of the likes of ChatGPT, it's extremely easy to make them fall completely flat. And then there's also the skeptics who say like, oh, this is just a big lookup table and there's nothing going on here. That's wrong as well. The truth is somewhere in between. And it's very important to understand as AI rapidly evolves what it can do and what it can't and what is really going on and what isn't. And the good news is there's a lot of research aimed at elucidating this, for example, at elucidating what transformers, which are the technology uh, underlying these large language models like ChatGPT, what it can and can't do. So, you know, our, our understanding is continuously improving. Unfortunate things like deep learning, they're at a particularly extreme trade off in the point between accuracy and comprehensibility, if you will. They're very accurate, they're very scalable, but there's this big pile of weights that even us, <laughs> we don't really understand what's going on there. Yeah, and, and part of this also is sort of not just sort of a function of, of looking to the left of the equal sign and maybe people being a little bit lazy because now they just have the the answers at their fingertips because of machine learning, but there's also the, the risk of manipulation that AI, machine learning can result in, right, in terms of people's emotions. And we, you can argue you see a lot of that when it comes to ad campaigns for various politicians. I, I'm curious how you view the sort of risk of manipulation of a society with artificial intelligence probably gets really largely controlled by just a few select players over time. 
So there is definitely a risk of manipulation, and it's exactly one of the things that people need to be aware of. And then, you know, we can certainly talk about that. The good news, however, is that, A, right now the ability to do that manipulation may be concentrated, but it's going to become less and less concentrated because any company, anybody can and will <laughs> use AI to do various things, including manipulating their customers. The good news, however, is that companies have been trying to manipulate you from day one. They always will. That's, that's so always good news. I've been manipulated since day one. That's, that's good news. I agree. No, but yes, but the good news is it's actually not that uneven of a bell if you think about it, right? You know, if you go back to the 1950s and when advertising began, there was this fear that like, you know, like, you know, TV commercials are going to push all your buttons and they're going to make you do what they want and it's going to be right. There was like this book called The Hidden Persuaders and so on. And this was a perfectly natural fear to have at the time. But again, what happened is that we humans aren't stupid either, right? And we can see that we're, you know, that they're trying to manipulate us. And we can get used to the trick, and we're actually very good at that. So, uh, again, uh, if this is a battle between humans and the AI trying to manip manipulate them, actually, at this point, humans still have the advantage. And maybe they will for a long time. Also because I think increasingly there will be AI on, 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 on both sides of this equation. And if you look, for example, at, you can ask, well, but today, right, how effective is Google or Facebook or whatever at manipulating with you with their ads? And the truth is, far, far less effective than people think they are. So, for example, right, let's say you spend $100,000 a year, right, that's your consumption, and, you know, how much are you worth to Google and, and, and Meta? Maybe $100, right? So, for all their vaunted AI power, they really, you know, multiply, their, that's the profit out of something, blah, 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 but, like, what you're worth to advertisers is a fraction, right, of what you spend. So, the upshot of this is, like, their influence for all their power on what you spend is, is a few percent. Let's call it 10%. It's really something very small, right? And, of course, the problem is that the Googles and the, and the Facebooks of the world don't advertise this. They say, like, oh, don't worry, right? We're not, we can't really manipulate you that much because that runs counter to their sales pitch, to their advertise, which is, like, we're so powerful. We target ads. And, indeed, targeting ads is a great thing. It's much more effective than mass sizing. But the problem is that match advertising is just ridiculously inefficient. And if you improve that by even 10%, you're already winning, right? You're still very far from being able to truly manipulate people. I feel like that's a good transition to talking about the role of regulation. I'm not a huge fan of public sector intelligence, so they probably need more artificial intelligence more broadly. But talk about the state of regulation. I mean, I've seen some things coming out of Europe and obviously in the U.S. as well. Do you find that the regulation is going to slow things down? Do you think it's needed over time? Talk through sort of how that interacts from a longer-term perspective. So, yes, this indeed is a very salient topic. I think that every business, chances are, needs some level and some kind of regulation. That's what's happened with other businesses. At least businesses, let me refine it. At least businesses that are large and impactful enough that there's a lot at stake, right? So, like, my kid's lemonade stand doesn't need regulated. But Google probably does, right? Google is very powerful, and the government needs to keep an eye on it on our behalf, right? Governments have their own problems, so we need to keep an eye on the government, keeping an eye on Google, right? And that's a lot of work. But there's a few, I think, very important things to say here. One is you shouldn't regulate something before you understand it. And my criticism of a lot of the regulations and laws coming out of the European Union in particular and I've, you know, I've talked to some of the decision makers there, including like, you know, members of the European Parliament, which made these laws and whatnot over time. And unfortunately, the problem is that they're regulating something that they don't understand. They don't understand technology. They don't understand how the machine learning and the AI work at a very basic level, which is shocking. You know, like Europeans like to think that Americans are the cowboys who shoot first and ask questions later. But in this regard, actually, Europe is the cowboy that regulates first and asks questions later. And then it passes these things like, like the GDPR and then these new, you know, digital blah, blah laws that are just coming into force, which are actually quite harmful, despite the good intentions with which they were made, right? And, and so, and, you know, we can talk about examples of that. Some of them, I think, are very illuminating and interesting. But just to answer your question about regulation in general, I think, first of all, you need to understand something before you regulate that, and that has not been the case. Second of all, regulating AI per se generally makes no sense. It's like regulating quantum mechanics, right? 
you need to regulate specific applications in the ways that are appropriate to them. So self-driving cars need regulated, just like cars we need regulated for our safety, et cetera, right? So we, we should make regulations for specific sectors, not for AI as a broad technology. That, that does naturally make a lot of sense. And again, it's something that someone who was looking at it from the outside and thinks of it as like this one thing that's everywhere might want to do, right? So there are all these ways in which you need to be careful about how you regulate AI. We're not seeing that happen. And then what happens is that the, the regulation winds up doing more good than harm. It winds up forbidding things that should be allowed, for example. This is typically the case with some of the most important EU regulation. Or also allowing things that, that, that shouldn't be, right? Because they don't even know what's going on. They don't even know what are the places where you can and should intervene and the ones you shouldn't. There's a lot of mistakes being made there. And you're like, you, you said something earlier, which is actually very on the point, which is the following. I'm always telling people in government, of which I've talked with a lot, you know, in America, you have another country, this is like the way you, but it's, you know, but this never sinks in and, you know, it won't like right away and, and except in rare cases. And I can see why, but we need to, to make this point, which is the way we make laws and regulations does not work for AI. They are rigid rules, which in AI we know are very brittle, right? And the whole point of AI is that it's continuously learning from data, evolving, changing what it does. The only good way for governments to deal with AI is, as you briefly mentioned, to have their own AIs. You need AIs to deal with AIs. And then those AIs have high-level goals that were set to them by the legislators, by we the people, by etc. But then what they do is like there's, a, there's an interaction between the Google AI and the government AI. And this is how things are going to are, have to look in the future Getting governments and every and bureaucrats and whatnot to understand that uh, will be a battle, but it but it's going to happen. Just for the remaining minutes, everybody, please make sure you follow Pedro Domingos and then check out his book, The Master Algorithm, on Amazon. Again, if you want to come up and ask questions, click that bottom left mic request button, and this will be available on all your favorite podcast platforms probably in a few days. Year on the the regulation side, you know, look, I mean. I think it's clear the the trend towards deeper, more involved, more complex artificial intelligence is not going to go away. But it might slow down if at some point you have a push back towards some kind of demand for privacy, right? Because you can't have AI without the large data behind it. The large data behind it largely is using information that people sometimes don't want to necessarily have available in a database. Do you see anything down the pipeline that that might cause some kind of societal pushback on the on the large data side. And I say that because you saw some of that with Apple and and Facebook, right? With the way that Apple kind of turned off some of the things that Facebook could see, which impacted their own data for targeting ads. What are your thoughts on sort of the, the, the pendulum swing back towards privacy? Well, so there is definitely a lot of interest in regulating AI, and you can see why, because the media talks about it and people worry about it, and that's natural. Uh, some of that, however, is that AI is very powerful, right? And anytime there's something very powerful, everybody t- wants to take control of it, right? Politicians want to take control of it because that's what they do and they care for their jobs and they have their political agenda. So if I'm left-wing, I will try to harness AI to do what I want. If I'm right-wing, well, actually, the right-wing is, is, is a lot behind the left-wing in doing this. But in principle, they'll try to do this as well. So you can't stop that. But you can, at the end, again, at the end of the day, it's about we the people. And if we don't want it, we, we can push back and say, no, we don't want it. And if it's important enough, that will eventually prevail. But what we can try to do that's more productive, we can try to channel it in the wrong direct, in the right directions. Right now, it, it tends, there's a tendency for it to go in the wrong directions for several reasons. And we touched on a couple of these. But like, we can try to you know, put pressure on towards good regulations and laws versus bad ones that don't actually serve our interests either because they're misguided or because they serve the interests of interest groups <laughs> that actually had the power to do that, which, by the way, is a lot of happens in Europe, right? The interest groups there that have the ear of the government, the, you know, the European Parliament, the European Commission, are traditional industries that really don't like tech, right? And that explains a lot about why Europe doesn't understand tech and make these regulations. So, you know, we can intervene in all of that. And privacy, of course, is a very salient one. And here's the thing, right? We can actually talk about what privacy is and how we value it, right? And, and in fact, 
it's interesting that privacy is historically a very recent concept that was invented by people like journalists and politicians and whatnot that had, you know, their own reasons to care about it that the general public actually doesn't, right? There are also people like famously Scott McNeely, CEO of Sun, who said, like, well, get over it, right? Because because there is no privacy in, in the global village. But I actually think that the bigger issue here is the following. The, the issue really is how, which you alluded to, is how do you use my data, right? And if you frame the issue in terms of privacy, you're already losing. Privacy is saying, like, I'm going to withhold my data because I'm afraid of the evil things that will be done with it, right? When, in fact, the great majority of the uses of data will be for my benefit even by other players. It's not a zero-sum game. This whole notion that you keep hearing that if the product is free, you're, you're the product, like, for example, Google is the poster child of this, this is actually false. These things are not zero-sum games. To a first approximation, when Google is using my data, it is using it for my benefit more than anybody else's. I'm worth 100 bucks a year to Google, right? That's the number of, that's their you know, revenue divided by their uh, number of users. There have been these studies about like how much is a search engine worth to me, and it's in the tens of thousands of dollars. So in this non-zero-sum game that we're playing, I'm winning by a factor of, of orders of magnitude more than, than the other side is winning. So to first approximation, all sides benefit. So which is not to say that it's, you know, uh, we're all perfectly aligned and we do need to worry about manipulation and whatnot, but like, let's keep this in perspective. To a first approximation, what I want is that my data be used for my benefit. I don't want to withhold it. This is not about privacy. It's about data sharing. It's about what data do I share with whom and who's in control of that, right? And there's definitely a lot to be done there. You know, uh, this could be less opaque. It could be more under the control of the user and so on and so forth. Again, the answer to this is not to ask for a cookie authorization every single time a new website comes up, which is what, you know, the European does and just continuously hassles people <laughs> for no good reason, right? And that's the list of examples. It's a famous one because it's something that you do every day. But like, we should think in terms of data sharing and not privacy. Privacy is just one extreme of data sharing. The other extreme is like everything that you get from me is public. You're allowed to do anything you want with it. And, and in some cases, that might even be the answer. But, you know, more generally, there's going to be something in the middle that's going to be different for different things. And what we want to do is negotiate and decide what all of that is. Let's go to uh, some of the audience. That's a great question. To be clear, I'm not arguing for minimal regulation. I'm arguing for the right regulation, for intelligent regulation, right? So as I said in the beginning, there, there will be regulation. And if it's the right regulation, it's, it's for the better. Right now, most of the regulation coming out is actually mostly misguided. So, you know, just to be clear on that. Now, things like copyright and who gets credit and who therefore gets, you know, paid and whatnot is a fascinating question when it comes to things like AI creativity. And I think there isn't going to be a single answer to this. And, and it, we'll see how it plays out, right? It depends also, like everything, on the power of the different players in this. And for example, you as the artist, right? One easy answer, and I think a lot of this will happen, is, is, is the following, right? You pay for, you buy, or you, you know, subscribe to or rent, whatever, one of these uh, AI bots that generate art, like Dali 2 or, or, or Stable Diffusion or whatever, right? And then, you know, and you pay that money, and as a result, you have the right to use what it generates for your purposes, right? So you generate all the art that you want, you're the artist, and you get paid. And the AI is just a tool, right? This, in some ways, is the default because it's the way other tools have been used before, Right? Now you could say, well, but if what the AI did was generate completely by itself the image that I saw, then why should you take that money? Good question. But then what will probably happen is the editor of the magazine that wants a magazine cover will just, you know, use the same tool to generate the cover and cut you out, right? So again, the AI there doesn't get paid a lot of money because at that point, let's face it, generating those things is very commoditized, right? Now, if you think about this, for something like a magazine cover, I probably don't just want the, you know, some, I push the button and I take what the AI generates. I, I probably need someone to know how to play with the AI to create what I want. And then that's the artist again. So I think what's going to happen in cases like that is that it really just has become another tool for the artist. And as you hinted at, and I wish everybody knew this, right? Again, this is an example of 
the AI isn't going to destroy your job. It's actually going to make you let you do your job better than you could do before. It's another tool, right? You know, art. All art is based on technology. Be it film or painting or 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 anything or or painting on caves, right? When a technology is created, it creates possibilities for artists. It creates a class of artists that use it. Every time a technology is new or changes, there's now. I mean, like as an artist, right? I would be cock a hoop over the possibilities that these programs create, right? I can now do art in the whole sort of ways that Picasso couldn't, right? So now I don't have to compete with Picasso anymore, right? This is actually fantastic news. So I think there's going to be a very interesting uh, and exciting process of artists discovering what they can do with the AI and also with people on the AI and the machine learning side, figuring out how to create their tools, how to build the tools in a way that makes it easy for the creators to use. You know, I was a, I was a musician in a previous life, and one of my favorite things to do was to create new sounds with synthesizers and samplers, right? And in fact, a lot of my value to the band was in creating new sounds that didn't exist before, and that was a lot of fun. But there was a type of artistic creation that just didn't exist 50 years ago because there were no synthesizers. And I think we're going to see a lot of that with AI in many different ways, and how this all plays out in terms of what become established forms of creation versus maybe more fringe or avant-garde ones, and how are the rewards distributed will be will be very interesting. But the key for you as an artist is, you know, get on top of it, learn to use it, right? Again, this is a great example of what we were saying about automation. There are, for example, you know, AI systems today that can generate prose, they can generate news stories, and, you know, typically about things like finance or sports. And it's not that they've put the finance and sports journalists out of jobs, it's that they have made it possible to, to cover, to write news coverage of things that before just didn't warrant the human cost. And likewise, when you make art cheaper, you're just going to make it possible to have art, original art, in all sorts of places that you couldn't before. So at the end of the day, what happens is there's more art, just like, you know, and this is what's happened pretty much across the board. And, and this, I think, is going to be another example. I have to say, it, it's interesting, right? Because the, you're not going to have another Picasso then, right? If it can just be partially commoditized, right? Just from machine learning. I mean, there is a kind of, an, I think, another interesting aspect, which is that you're not going to have these these sort of legends with hindsight that could do things nobody else could do because now everybody else can do what everybody else can do. Oh, like I, I would say something slightly different, which is, again, just like other things, it's going to be commoditized at one end of the scale and then on a very large scale, which is good because people will have it that couldn't before. But at the end of the scale, there won't be a Picasso, but there will be a different kind of Picasso, right? There will be people, I would predict, that will be geniuses at creating art with AI. And I really look forward to seeing what those geniuses do. And, you know, there's a question of how does the market work and not really be a Picasso, but, you know, like these power laws of impact are very sturdy, right? So I would be very surprised. Like, for example, you could say, oh, with photography, you could say, people did say, with photography, there will be no Picassos anymore. And yet you have the Picassos of photography. It will be the same thing with, with AI art. And that kind of goes to the consciousness question, I guess, right, Pedro? Yeah, sure. So this is a very, well, yes and no, right? So because intelligence and consciousness are different, but it's, this is, you can have either without the other, then, you know, we can certainly get to this. But uh, I'm glad you asked this question because this is a very common and very natural one. First of all, if you ask the experts, most of us don't think that general AI is a decade out. It's decades out, maybe hundreds of years, who knows, right? But I would be very surprised if we had general AI in 10 years. Now, it is the case that if AI learns by imitating people, and that is definitely one of the things that we does, that it does, that we have, you know, created the algorithms to do. If it lear if it's learning from people who behave greedily or deceitfully or whatnot, it will start doing the same, right? So we have to worry about all those things. For example, we have to worry about detecting deceit. Like, for example, if you're a journalist, you need to you know, learn to detect AI-generated misinformation. And again, the answer to this is that you need your own AI tools. You trying to detect deceit that is generated on an industrial scale while you don't have industrial scale AI to deal with it is a losing proposition, right? It's like trying to find tanks with spears. So we need all the different places to have AI to do things like, for example, you know, like, we're negotiating, we should both have AIs to do some of the negotiating, right? We're lawyers, we're companies, right? This is going to happen everywhere. Now, the, you just took a very big leap there from saying like, oh, the AI is being used for deception to the AI will start doing its own deception on its own behalf. 
right? And again, people worry about this. It's the terminated scenario. The good news is this is very unlikely to happen for a couple of reasons, right? One reason is that the AI is a tool, and, and the AI cannot suddenly decide to not be a tool. And again, if you understand how the AI works, you understand why this is different from kind of like the popular myth. An AI is an optimizer, and, and you know a lot of the power goes into making the optimization better and larger scale and whatnot, but the optimizer is controlled by an objective function. And the objective function, the goal of the system, is, for example, maximize engagement, right? And the AI can choose to not maximize that because machine learning is like evolution, right? We are evolving these algorithms to serve us. And as soon as an algorithm starts to not serve us, it dies. It's evolution. It's like, you know, it's like breathing of animals, right? I mean, think about this. If you have a dog, you don't worry that the dog is going to wake up one night and decide to, you know, kill you, right? How many people worry about their dogs killing them? But dogs are just domesticated wolves, right? The thing is that, like, generation by generation, we turn those wolves into our friends. Well, guess what? With AI... Those robots, those dogs, those everything, they were created step by step to only let survive the ones that best serve us, right? So it's very unlikely that by that process, you would ever create an AI that suddenly decides to, oh, hey, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to, you know, kill people. In natural language, there's always exceptions, right? But here's the thing. Hardly anybody who owns a dog worries about that, and indeed they don't need to, and they shouldn't. I will say this whole conversation makes me very worried now (laughs) that I'm going to wake up with a dog in my face. Think of cops and robbers, right? You can use a car to rob a bank. That's not a reason to not have cars. It's a reason for the cops to have faster cars than the robbers. And same thing with AI. The real problem with AI is the people who will use it for evil deeds. And the solution to that, both to the evil people and the potentially evil AI, is to have more powerful AI on the good side. And that's another thing, is that you know, if a bad AI ever appears like that, and somebody will create it because people are mischievous, right, or have whatever intentions, but the thing is, there will be an AI criminal, and there will be what, what William Gibson in Neuromancer famously called the Turing police, right? And the power of the Turing police will be much greater than that of the AI, of the bad AIs, right? And, and so in the same way that criminals have not taken over the world because they can, whatever, use cars and weapons, the same thing will be the case with, with AI. I want to get a couple more questions again. Everybody, please make sure you follow Pedro here on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. And again, this, this is what I was saying, right, is that for the most part, what, you, what happens is that it's not that the artist gets cut out, is that the artist has a new tool, and the question is learning how to use it. Right now, precisely the way you learn how to use it is the way you, you, learn, you learn how to prompt it, the same way a painter would learn how to use a toothbrush, and the people who are better at using the prompts would get better results and better jobs and and higher pay than more success than the ones who don't. So, so you're absolutely right. Having said that, uh, it's important to, to realize that the AI is constantly evolving, right? So if you compare that with other technologies for artistic creation, the way you know they were when they became mature is very different from the way they were in the beginning. So you know, I'd be surprised if what people are doing for the most part with AI 10 years from now for artistic creation is just designing better prompts. That may be part of it, but there are probably a lot of other and some of them probably more interesting things. Well, you asked a lot of questions there. Let me, let me see if I can get to some of them. Explainability is, is, is a big one and underlies a lot of this. Let me give you an example. So the GDPR requires that all material decisions about people be explainable you know, by decisions by algorithms. And this is kind of funny because if you take it literally, it means that deep learning is illegal, right? Deep learning is not explainable, so sorry. You just can't use it. But now, that clearly seems a little too extreme, right? Think about the following, right? What if I give you the choice between being diagnosed by a machine that is 99% accurate but gives no explanations and is 90% accurate but explains what it does? Which one would you prefer? I would actually prefer the one that's 99% accurate, right? And this is a very common trade-off because the more accurate models are usually the more complex ones and therefore the less explainable. But the bigger point here is that some people might prefer one or the other. It is not for the European Union or anybody else to make that decision in advance in one direction on behalf of everybody. So there is the quintessential example of a bad, misguided regulation with good intentions, right? This intuition that decisions should be explainable is understandable. And, and again, the intentions are good, but it doesn't, it's from, it, it comes from not understanding that there's this, you know, often unavoidable trade-off between accuracy and explainability 
and it's for us individually as as people, as companies, as decision makers to decide where we want to be on that spectrum. And picking out one point of the spectrum by law is just a terrible idea. And by the way, the same thing goes for a lot of the things like bias and, you know, like where the regulators should intervene. Again, they tend to intervene by imposing their own intentions or ideology or whatnot. And often they wind up even harming not just, you know, society or the or the target users in general, but even their own agenda, because again, they don't understand what they're doing. So again, understand before you regulate, then the way to regulate is to say, here are the terms that should be in your objective function. We could say that explainability, and this can be done, right? We can have something that favors more interpretable models, and that can be in there as a term. It shouldn't be a black and white rule. You can then set that weight of that term in your objective function, and people can take part in doing this, right? You know, a good analogy to this is like driving a car, right? We, meaning you and me and decision makers and policy makers, we're like the drivers of the car. We don't, you know, the driver of a car doesn't need to understand how the engine works or tinker with the engine, right? That would probably, you know, in most cases have very bad results, right? The engine, how the engine works is for the mechanics. But we do need to know about steering wheel and pedals and how to use them. Same thing here. The steering wheel of an AI algorithm is the objecting function, and that's what we should have a debate about. It should have business terms because businesses are entitled to follow their goals and make money. It should have maybe societal terms that are put there by regulation and monitored by regulation, and we can decide what they are. And different societies will make different choices. And then most importantly, and I think with the highest weight, it just needs to have your own personal individual terms. More than anything else, that what the AI should be doing is maximizing your utility, you the user, not the company that provided it, not the government, not other people who want to dictate what you do, but you. So I think this is what a more mature use of society, of AI in society will look like. It is unfortunately not where things are currently headed, but you know we can keep pushing it in the right direction. Well, indeed, it will vary by industry and by product. And as I said before, explainability is always a good thing. The problem is that there's a trade-off with other things. As a rule, when decisions are unimportant and made in large numbers, explainability is not a priority because nobody's going to look at them individually and individually they don't make that much difference, right? So it'd be nice if, you know, when Gmail puts something in my spam folder, it can explain why. And in fact, that's not hard to do, but, but who cares, right? Whereas if decisions are highly consequential, then they'd better be explainable, right? If a system recommends that I get surgery, I'd rather explain to me why. And, and we actually can do that. By the way, the thing about human doctors, though, is that they're very good at the PR side of things, right? You, you'll ask them, like, but why? And they'll say something, and you'll be satisfied with that explanation, which in reality is far from inadequate, right? And I can, I can well see attaching one of these GPT-like chatbots to every medical decision-making system using AI that when it makes a diagnosis or, or recommends something, and then you ask why, it generates some text that makes you feel like it was justified and also, you know, satisfies the law in the EU, but is actually not a very deep explanation. We, this is already what we're satisfied with coming from people, right? And in the, in the end, we probably can have better from AI, but, but there'll be this full range of things. Now, at the, at the most, I would say, how to call it, important, consequential decision end of the spectrum, you actually want to behave, you want the AI to behave in such a way that you can understand what it's doing, like you can understand what people are doing, even if you don't ask it questions. Right? We have models of each other. That's what theory of mind and, and social life is about. It's just that some of the social agents now are going to be machines and we're going to have models of each other. Them of us and we of them. And we of them, you know, dialoguing with us and it's this interesting infinite recursion. And as with other people, we should be able to have a continuing dialogue with them, right? It, ex it explains something and I say like, well, I buy that part, but that one I didn't understand or I need more justification on that one, change this, change that. We should be able to have that. And largely, I don't think we're going to need regulation to make that happen because as people get more comfortable with AI and start having a real model of what it is as opposed to some oversimplified one by analogy with other things, which is what happens at the beginning of every technology, it will just be highly benefit. You know, like the sellers of AI will be competing to make them easier to use in this way. So you know, I think this is going to happen, is already starting to happen and doesn't even need any regulation. And in fact, trying to regulate that would probably hinder it 
and, and slow down progress uh, rather than help it. I think that's a good place to end this Twitter space. Again, everybody, please make sure you follow Pedro Domingos. Check out his book, The Master Algorithm, on Amazon. Pedro, first time you and I are speaking, I've had a couple of other people in the AI space, Gary Kasparov and others. I think it might be good to have a group panel discussion at some point. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And uh, if I don't see you, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Pedro.